sorry, yes. Uh, so again, welcome everyone. Um, so uh, for those who don't know me, I'm uh, Renata Mirulla. I facilitate the Eval Forward Community of Practice, which is organizing this webinar today uh, in collaboration with Eval Indigenous, which is uh, one of the sister networks of the Eval Partners family. Uh, so um, this session is a part of the Eval Forward talk series, uh, which are informal webinars uh, aimed to share knowledge between members of the community and beyond anyone interested in the topic. Uh, but uh, uh, let me go to the agenda for today's uh, session. So we'll have um, a short introduction by Daniel Tysers. Who, he is the one who raised this discussion, this discussion topic on Eval Forward. Uh, so he's a, um, he's a freelance consultant and he defines himself as a reluctant evaluator. Uh, his passion being more on monitoring with a focus on listening and learning from those who implement programs and uh, especially those who are the final beneficiaries or uh, communities uh, um, receiving or uh, part of the programs. He holds a Master's of Science in Agricultural Economics and is based in London. Then uh, after Daniel, we'll have John Jovu, and he's um, very happy to welcome John to this webinar. He also participated in the, in the discussion. He's a, a global uh, thought leader in evaluation uh, in indigenous voices and evaluation, indigenous evaluation. And uh, um, he's based in Zambia and is an honorary member of the Zambia Monitoring and Evaluation Association. Uh, we are very pleased again to have John uh, here with us today. Uh, and uh, then we'll have uh, time for questions, answers, and for sharing your experiences. So without uh, further taking more time from our speakers, I'll hand over now to Daniel. Daniel, to you. Thanks. Thanks, Renata. Um, and especially and to Nicola and Sam as well for organizing all this. And Thank you too, Renata, for the suspiciously nice introduction of me. Um, so I have seven minutes to set this up, so I'll be terse and choose my words carefully and perhaps, well, not perhaps, but we'll have a, have a few pops along the way. So the purpose of the webinar is very simple. It's, it's to support John, his leadership of Eval Indigenous, get some movement um, to pursue and, and follow its mission. I want to talk about three things. The first is the context. Um, then I want to, and it would be amiss of me not to, try and synthesize some of the key points uh, that, that preceded this webinar and, and the online discussion that Renato talked about. Um, the initial idea came from a discussion I had when I had a, a meal with um, Professor Bob Picciotto who was talking to me about indigenous evaluation and complexity and, and, and so on. And I always thought that I was a kind of culturally appropriate kind of transient evaluator. Um, but he, he raised the issue of no cultural appropriate evaluation is very different to indigenous evaluation. It's an established methodology um, in Canada, in the States and, and all across the world, uh, accounting for 8% of the world's population, which to give you a perspective, that's more than the number of people who live in Russia and the United States. Um, I'm going to read out a quote he gave me that really kind of inspired me and, and shocked me at the same time. Um, and I hope it does for some of you too. So let me let me say. Indigenous evaluation promotes sustainability by respecting nature and all living beings. It is committed, spirited, and open to fresh ideas. It's multidisciplinary and adaptable. It embraces diversity, sharing, and tolerance. It reflects and rejects, rather, the self-important narcissism of power holders. And it ignores the pronouncements of evaluators addicted to single narratives and rigid methodological dogmas. The Donor Committee for Enterprise Development Results Measurement Standard, for me and many others I know, springs to mind. It's unlettered and olympically bureaucratic and controlling. 
It works, indigenous evaluation, effectively in a wide range of local contexts. It also has a global reach. And Bob concludes by saying, isn't it time for the rest of the evaluation community to take notice? Why not indigenous evaluation as opposed to patterns proffer of developmental evaluation? Why can't we define indigenous evaluation as the new wave? After all, they embrace complexity and it baffles Western society. The webinar is also very timely, but it's about a lot, a lot of uh, conversations going around about the decolonization of development uh, and how, how the, the Western, I hate the word, but I'll use it, narrative um, is, getting, is, is getting dominant uh, even in that debate. Um, there's a Nigerian professor from Ibadan who wrote a wonderful piece. His name is Ahok Hinaya. Don't cry for me, Africa. He's claiming, and this was in 2010, that African voices get crowded out by friends of Africa, Tony Blair, Commission for Africa, Obama's rather unremarkable Feed the Future program, um, and Western evaluators too. I don't mean decolonization in a Franz Fanon way of destruction, but I do mean it in a way that I learned because my first job was as a cricketer, playing cricket for the same club as many West Indians. And I remember as a 13 being, year old being enthralled by the West Indies team who came to the UK, who galvanized the Afro-Caribbean communities in Birmingham, in London and elsewhere. Uh, there's a wonderful documentary called Fire from Babylon. And I learned much of my cricket, not from my culture in England, but from the culture in the West Indies. So I was privileged to go there and play. The other issue around evaluation, it's become a victim of bureaucratic and political capture. Raimondo and Dalla Larson's expose in their keynote address at the European Evaluation Society Conference in, in Copenhagen earlier this year, and the predominance of mindless evaluation machines that are accountable to those who commission and pay for them and are limited to the pursuit of accountability to those who design and approve programs. They afford privilege to their administrative requirements and corporate objectives by playing around with how those align with SDGs. No, this is not good enough. They afford that privilege. It reminds me of an old saying from 1903 made by the famous sociologist um, Hausmann, where he, and for the purpose of this introduction, basically kind of says that evaluation, evaluation is used rather like a drunk woman or man uses a lamppost for support, not enlightenment. I want to now get on to the second part of the introduction, which is around some of the issues that, that were raised in the discuss online discussion that I thought were particularly revealing. I'm not picking out single ones because I think they're the best, but I'm picking them out because they relate very much as powerful messages that I wanted to share, as they say in some communities, with you all. Mustafa Malki, basically started off by saying, well, by the time evaluation comes, it's too late. The damage is done. It's, it's too late to undo that. How can evaluation do that? Um, it met, sprang to mind issues that Patton's proposition of developmental evaluation makes, which, well, you can actually bring it forward into ex ante evaluation. That's also a type of evaluation. And I think that it, it's, it's time to actually integrate indigenous evaluation into the appraisal and the basis on which investment decisions are made by the funder. Um, so I thought that was a, a, a good point read by, by Mustafa. Silva Ferretti had two wonderful contributions that talks about by the time you get to the community, you know, with your clipboard and interviewing schedule and results and questions littered around the indicators in some needy theory of change or results framework, um, it's too late, you may as well go back. Absolutely, whose results are we talking about here? Whose theory of change? It's issue of Silva, how she raised the issue of white supremacy. Um, a tip I, I wanna share is, is when we did an impact evaluation in Bangladesh, the first thing we did in Inception was to go out to some communities and ask them questions that you would normally ask yourselves in developing a theory of change. And we asked the communities, 
we didn't use the term theory of change. I don't like it anyway. Theory is very kind of academically loaded and off-putting. So we, we just talked about the problems they're having, the reasons for the problems, the consequences, and who felt the most, and so on in the community. And it, it, it goes without saying, and I don't have to tell a participant audience like you what the consequences were. Pedro del Bedon also talked about how indigenous cultures embrace nature and biodiversity. And he made, I thought, a really passionate kind of narrative around um, indigenous cultures and how they've embraced nature and biodiversity for centuries. Um, a tip for you was that I, my most kind of a key moment in my career was spending time with the late and great Zephaniah Piri in the drylands in the southern part of Zimbabwe, a master water harvester who was written up in the National Geographic and supported by the amazing work of Ken Wilson. And the tip I learned was that have conversations with communities on issues that, that, that matter to them. Treat them as subjects of conversations on issues that matter to them, not, not as objects of an interview based on questions that, that matter to some log frame or, or, or the interviewer. Um, one, one person asked a question about how to design culturally appropriate evaluation tools in the context of climate advocacy at community level. My answer is twofold. First of all, indirect, then direct. Indirect, please let us rid this horrible term climate smart. I find it quite offensive and patronizing and I talked with farmers in Mali who heard the term from some aid program and they didn't understand why they thought foreigners could come and teach them how to be climate smart. Um, I don't feel as again, the need to explain that anymore. The direct answer, the tool, it's not so much a tool for the, for the person who posed the question, which is actually, well, first of all, if I was going to go and evaluate that kind of project, I would, as my starter for 10, would learn about how they evaluate their work. What are their objectives and how do they evaluate their work? Finally, I just wanted to talk about two um, I won't, uh, transient evaluators, Amelia Breton and Pamela Diane White made, made some really good comments about the travails of being a transient evaluator. And Amelia was talking about sometimes indigenous cultures stereotype her and her culture and where they come from. Uh, and, and Pamela was talking about the fear of interrupting or disrupting community norms and values and who defines and governs these at community level, who to listen to. Uh, the, the takeaway from that was, I think, first of all, to understand before you go there, talking to local people about how those communities um, vary um, and the diversity to, to give you an idea of who to talk to so that you give them voice across, across the different groups within the community, whether that's men or women or young and old or, or ethnic or, or religious divides. Um, so I think that's, that's really important so you don't stumble too much. I've learned a lot in that respect. Right, I've shot my bolt and I'm gonna hand over, I think, to Renata. Thank you very much. Thanks, Daniel. I'm going to hand over to John, actually. Uh, he's our main uh, speaker today. So, John, uh, over to you. Thank you, Renata, and uh, thank you for the introduction. Well, the topic uh, is wonderful uh, right now because of uh, what Daniel said, uh, that um, we, we are in an interesting period and we are having indigenous uh, evaluators coming forward and asking questions. So I'll start from uh, the development of m and in Africa. We all know that we, we got our independence around the 1950s, most of us. And then 1970s, we had the economic crisis uh, due to uh, the war which was in the Middle East, um, lack of fuel and finances. We therefore started asking for assistance and that assistance led to us opening our countries, uh, 
to charities and uh, multinationals, international organizations that were in development. So we saw an influx of uh, external experts coming to Africa to help us. Could we move the slide? So we had a lot of actors, external actors coming to help us, but there was no harmony in the field. Uh, so 2005, donor agencies, academics, government officials met in Paris and came up with the, the declaration to harmonize what they were doing and give ownership to us who are recipients of aid. But uh, it wasn't happening. So because of that, there was also another meeting which took place in Accra to say, oh, you guys, could we speed up what you said and um, uh, try and get ownership over to, to recipient countries and um, oh, the new people who are coming into evaluation because they were talking of developing evaluation capacity of um, recipients. So we saw VOPES developing after that. And in Zambia, we saw a national development plan for five years that included the concept of uh, monitoring and evaluation. Please move the slide. Now we are here. We are here now where it has become fashionable to talk of decolonizing evaluation. Uh, why? In 2015, we had the UN declaring that year as uh, the year of evaluation and all of us were standing up with torches everywhere saying no. Uh, evaluation should become part of our culture. So since Nepal, uh, when we had the 2015 declaration that uh, evaluation should be linked to the 2020 agenda, we've seen a growth of VOPES and uh, an increase in the voices calling for decolonizing evaluation, and that is linked to the sustainable development goals. The focus has been not leaving anyone behind. But we should remember that for us here in Africa, we started talking about decolonizing evaluation way before 2015. By 2012, we had what was termed as made in Africa evaluation. We already were talking about that. And also remember that our, some of our prominent African people were engaged in setting up some of uh, these international VOPs that are controlling much of uh, the evaluation activities around the world. We should remember our late uh, Dr. Saleh Gariba getting involved in the formation of ideas, the International Development Evaluation Association. So it's not a new concept to us. What has happened, uh, could you move, Renata? What has happened is now uh, we have the bottom, the masses as we call them, or people like to call them asking for more in terms of accountability and transparency. And saying at the core of um, all these international pillars of development, there is racism. So we had the UN which declared the declaration on rights of indigenous people, that's uh, UN DRIP, and our colleagues in Canada, the States and New Zealand and uh, in other places have been like ahead in asking 
for indigenous people now to own development in the communities. So we are coming back to 2005 and the declaration, the Paris Declaration ownership. So here we have seen that Afria, which had started talking about it in 2012, has sort of sat back and let others go ahead of them. Zia, Zambia Evaluation Association, which I headed, had started earlier, but uh, we have had our challenges. Renata, please. We have had our challenges. So during the declaration of the UN year of evaluation, people who met in Nepal, in a parliament, started talking of joining forces, indigenous voices in evaluation joining forces, that we have been talking of national evaluation capacity for years. And for Zambia, 58 years, we're still, keeping, still talking about developing national evaluation capacity. What has happened? What is the reason why we haven't been moving? Samia is there in South Africa. Uh, and it started later than us, but uh, they took over leadership somewhere and Zia went down. Afria, Afria because of the way it was set up. It didn't have the organizational strength because at that time, well, it was fashionable to have things happening in Africa. Kofi Annan was the secretary general and it was fashionable to link development and a development in indigenous communities to Accra. So we ended up with Afria in Accra. A very indigenous was formally established in Bishkek in 2017 during the third global evaluation forum. It is a network of partners from a lot of VOPES in Canada, America, Africa, Asia, and the Pacifics. We started talking of having our voices heard. We have been followers for a long time. And like Daniel said, we've had a lot of transient evaluators who have no link to our lands. First of all, the prime thing is the link to the land. And if we have been talking of national evaluation capacity, why has it failed? It's because of what has been happening. Yes, we have people of color that have been heading some of these international institutions in evaluation. We have people sitting at high tables, but that has been on the individual, individual levels. So they've got good CVs and the, our young emerging evaluators get plucked from our continent, from our poor communities and they work in uh, these good communities, go to good neighborhoods and they forget about us. So Eva Indigenous has a project that identifies who are these indigenous evaluators and where are they? And tries to ask whoever who is going into these communities, commissioners, to link up with these evaluators. Yes, uh, you may say, no, um, I'm culturally sensitive or responsive, and I know what to do. I may be from the north or from a transient evaluation firm, but I know what to do. But our friends in Canada and the USA and New Zealand have been saying, no, that's not enough. It's not enough. Do you really identify with the community? 
Renata, please. I've already talked of Made in Africa evaluation. So we have seen that uh, we want to move from just talking to making it happen. We are not going into communities and looking at them as objects, as just informants. After you've collected your data, you have no interest in them. So whether the project fails, you won't be there. The advice you, uh, you give if you're a transit developer won't follow you because you won't come back after five years and look at the project. But the community has to look at that project. If it's a well, they'll be looking at it. You left it. It's if empowerment for women, they'll be looking at what you brought after five years. So there is a need of saying, yes, uh, by definition, cultural responsive involves you being sensitive or putting at the center the culture, tradition, and uh, cultural context of the communities where you are working in. But we are going beyond that and calling for cultural responsive indigenous evaluations that involves the communities themselves who are in the places where you are putting up your projects, your programs. So we are having that difference. Yes, you have your checklist and you, you can come in and uh, tick, 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 greet the, the chief, uh, talk nicely, dress in nice chitengas like mine, but it's going beyond that. As indigenous evaluators, we are asking, are you giving capacity? Are you empowering that community to take over? That's why we've come up with the, those 10 questions that communities have to ask evaluators when go, they go in. So as an evaluation community, are we ready to accept that we have made mistakes and we have come to this brink of catastrophe because of our compliance? And because of the way us, the assimilados, as people who are representing the indigenous, communities, the people of color, the blacks have been performing in the past. We have sat at the high tables, shaken hands with the queen and kings and showed our backside as black peacocks to others who are left behind, that we are there in our surface, that we sit at the tables. But what have we done for our communities? We sit there. Yes, you can be a board member of a big organization, but as long as it remains on individual benefits and you're not looking back, then you haven't been of aid to your community. So let's get to be talking. Let's get our governments to invest in collecting our indigenous knowledge and our academia to package, package it in such a way that we are able to get people from the global north that are in power, including our brothers and sisters who are now up there to be able to defend what we're doing. That is slacker, it's good to think of our indigenous knowledge and that when you're using our indigenous knowledge, it didn't bring us to the age of uh, catastrophe that the humanity is facing. So we have to go back. We have our philosophies, the Ubuntu philosophy. You exist because I exist. 
we take care of each other, we take care of nature. It's not a, a matter of, yes, I've, I'm now on top, I'm the head, and uh, I live uh, on top of a uh, hundred story building. No, 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 no. Those people we are leaving behind, they will come and pull you down. We saw what happened in Sri Lanka. We saw what happened in Sri Lanka. We've got uh, a lot of examples of traditional governance evaluations. Uh, take for instance, up north here in Zambia, they are the Wheeler people who have the governance system and an evaluation system where there is a group of entertainers. They go into the village, they gather the stories, come back to the chief and perform a play or a song to tell him how the village is and what can be done. And if it is a challenge to the people, they have the warrant to insult the chief. It's not like now where I, in modern governance, if I'm critical of the current ruling government, I'll be locked up. So we have to try and go back to our traditional methods. Uh, let's support our VOPES. Let's support our indigenous evaluators in the community communities. And when you talk of national evaluation capacity building, let's include indigenous evaluation knowledge. Renata. <laughs> What do we need to do? Of course, uh, we all know that we've got uh, the Paris Declaration and most people have forgotten about it, but we need to go back to it. We need to go back to it. We've got declarations in almost all the big VOPE. 2019 ideas also came up with the uh, transformative indigenous knowledge. Uh, way back in 20, uh, 2007, Naame, we were talking of supporting uh, every evaluator and growing evaluation in Africa. So we've, we've got this knowledge, academia, there are a lot of papers here in Africa and outside, but we have to move. Where is the entry point? Of course, we've got AFRIA itself. We've got the American Evolution Association. We've got up here, uh, Asia Pacific, uh, the Canadian Evolution Society, about uh, indigenous ideas. And uh, we should also say that uh, even in UK, Daniel, you may have indigenous people there, only that you don't capture them. So we need to have all these entry points What's the challenge? Finances, of course. Finances, it's because uh, we have all these players in Africa, CREA, AA, uh, others who are getting the funding we should be going to indigenous VOPES and people in the communities. So it's becoming now on a personal level. Can you move away from the old thinking and thinking of how do I help? So volunteer at the universities in the community-based organization, CBO. We have what is called scorecarding. The reason why we are having so many failures in, in our governance structure is because we have concentrated on the empowering the capacity on the top level, officers in government and a few students, but left out the people, the majority of people. But we are talking that that is not leading us anywhere because we, we, we have an example from South Africa where we were saying, oh, we've got a champion of evaluation and all that, but look at the national capture, which was there. You left out the people. Now is the time to look at 
reversing that, have a bottom-up approach. And I hope uh, our donors are listening. That's what EVA Indigenous is doing, is going into communities, gathering the stories and sharing from Canada, USA, Zambia, Cameroon, New Zealand, Australia, we are sharing the stories. That is enough. Uh, there is nobody who is going to come out, come from somewhere and change the way things are done unless we ourselves, BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, people of color, take charge. And that is going to happen if our current generation of youngsters come aboard, the emerging evaluators. They have seen what we have done as black peacocks. We have sat on these boards, but we haven't taken the community with us. So let's move, get the young people uh, aboard and think of seven generations ahead that whatever we are doing today will be of use to the next seven generations. Renata. Thanks so much, John. Thanks so much yes. for such an inspiring uh, <laughs> presentation. I want to thank also Nicola because she was there behind the slides. Nicola has to leave us now, so uh, thanks Nicola for your support. Uh, we had a poll, just like to break the ice of this, um, uh, let's, let's say this part of the webinar where we can uh, discuss, share questions with uh, John and Daniel or share your experience. So I'll just uh, propose this, uh, um, this poll and ask you uh, what's the most important challenge for evaluation as a dis discipline to embrace cultural diversity and benefit indigenous communities. If you could choose one, or let's see what comes out from uh, our audience uh, after listening to Daniel and uh, John. I'll give just a few more seconds and we'll see. See people still voting. <laughs> okay, I'll see. Just a few seconds more. <laughs> okay. Okay, so let's see the results. Okay, all of the above. <laughs> and the focus on donor results instead of uh, ultimate client. Let's say these two are the most. Most see. Yes. Yeah. Uh, someone, someone said also none of the above would be nice also to hear what, what, other, what <laughs> other challenges there are. So I'll stop sharing the poll and uh, I'll just open the discussion. We had, um, we wanted to propose uh, here, just like if you have questions, first of all, for uh, John and for Daniel, or uh, otherwise, e even if you want to share your experience uh, for approaching uh, cultural diversity and indigenous evaluation, and uh, what's the way forward. So John uh, shared with us some challenges and some ideas for the way forward. And uh, yes, we'd like to hear from you. Uh, please feel free to just like uh, share on the chat or raise your hand. We have uh, 
some time now for discussion. I see that over on the chat, um, some, some of the participants have asked about your 10 questions, John, and I also share them. And Patricia Rogers is commenting that these 10 questions are great and make very concrete, important principles of community ownership that John was discussing and which other frameworks have highlighted uh, and uh, which other frameworks have highlighted this, I think, yes. Um, okay, so there's another, I'm just reading the comments uh, from Paddy, uh, great uh, to be here, thank you John for an insightful and inspiring presentation, also happy 58th Independence Day Zambia <laughs> falls today. <laughs> uh, in coexisting, when we will see evaluation methodology that end up influencing tours for evaluation assignment emanating from the voices uh, of empowerment, um, empowered communities where the evaluation take place. More concretely, what we, will it take to bring the 10 Invalid Indigenous questions to be institutionalized by Beyond Vope and Afrea and blossom from an open secret among interested evaluators? It's true because I also learned about these 10 questions <laughs> thanks to your contribution and to Anna, another colleague contributing to the discussion yeah. who, who brought them. So I don't know if you want to start commenting on these and then I see, we'll see if. Yes, there are other questions for you, Daniel. So about the 10 questions, you want to say what are the plans or um, yes, anything you'd like to comment on on this? Yes, we, we are trying to disseminate uh, the 10 questions to communities, uh, indigenous communities. And uh, they are on the Evao Partners website, uh, if you need to have a look at them and share. So uh, you may be aware that uh, for the last three years, it's been difficult. We, in the NGOs communities, have uh, been constrained um, financially. So we, we have our voice project, but we haven't been able to go to as many communities as we would love. And then there is the challenge that uh, internet is mainly used by very few people. Uh, so we would love to get to communities which may not have access to webinars like this one. Um, we, we are thinking of resource mobilization uh, to be able to get the questions across to as many communities as we can. And uh, if you are in the position to help disseminate them, please uh, feel free to come aboard. What we can do from our side is that we will uh, share the recording and your presentation and also the link to the questions with all those who register to this webinar, which are many more than those who are actually yeah, were able crazy. to attend. But yeah. uh, the signing up to a webinar is also a sign of interest, uh, of course, and then uh, things happen in life and you cannot attend, we all know that. Yeah. Uh, I see uh, I see from uh, Tierno Diouf, uh, uh, I would be interested to know what is so far the contribution of, uh, contribution of Made of Africa evaluation to the decolonization of evaluation. While even Africa has too many different cultures, are there any frameworks that can be used to make evaluations in Africa culture driven? To you, John. Well, um, made in Africa evaluation, the slogan has been around for some time. Uh, and I believe it's now when um, institutions like AFRIA are getting to organize themselves and ensure that it gets taken aboard. Uh, Mark is around, uh, Mark Abram is uh, around. Uh, they did a collection of papers on the Medi in Africa evaluation. And I am hoping that now we will see more action 
My feeling is that um, the organization that uh, should be spearheading all this is that of African unity. It's the, the organization that uh, is like the United Nations uh, for Africa. Uh, but if they don't uh, invest in it, then we will have challenges. Uh, VOPES alone cannot manage. So governments have to come aboard. And uh, it's the government, if it can put aside some money in its national budget to help develop um, the indigenous evolution capacity, that would be helpful. Thank you very much, John. I'll take another question from the chat, and then I see Paddy also raised their hand. Uh, so, Zuleka, uh, how uh, can emerging scholar practitioners get, get involved more? What roles can Africa diaspora, other people of color communities play in this work? So, if you could uh, uh, briefly answer so to Zuleka, John, and uh, then we can ask uh, Paddy. We, we have institutions of learning across Africa. Uh, they could learn from what is happening in Canada and the USA uh, because they have uh, moved this uh, uh, tribal critical theory uh, more. And uh, even uh, the indigenous aspect in evolution, they are voicing that. And uh, they have the advantage in that in the communities, they have these centers of learning which protect the indigenous knowledge. And they are able uh, with maybe one voice advocate for that. Um, even our friends in New Zealand, uh, they can fight that uh, no non-indigenous uh, people shouldn't go into indigenous communities and carry out evolution evolutions. Uh, transient evaluators uh, have been for a long time doing that, but uh, the world is changing. The call is to pass on. Um, is it the stick? We, we know that um, that road which you carry is having some Greek or Romanic or Druze uh, connection and when you come into Africa, you try to use that road, it won't perform the magic because the African trees don't recognize that tree. So uh, this is what's happening. Indigenous voices are calling that uh, uh, there should be that change. Uh, the world organizations should accept it. It's not just being politically correct or just fashionable calling for decolonization, but you still have control. Uh, uh, that's what is happening, yeah. Thanks, I'll uh, invite Paddy, uh, who raised her hand to intervene. Paddy, you're still mm -hmm. there? Yes. Uh, hello, John. Hello. Uh, uh, hello. Uh, thank you. Hello, happy Independence Day. I'm I'm sitting very far away from Zambia today, but uh, the WhatsApp chat the much. colorful exactly. So I, I think um, <laughs> it's it's also a good it's 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 a good topic for for uh, for a day for a day. <laughs> yes, exactly, a very good topic for Independence yeah. Day. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but also, I think a reminder of the very important work that's sitting on hand. And I just wanted to actually point out a question that Arnoa has already raised. Um, and to bring in, I think, Zuleka's last question, I don't know, John, if you saw, it was about the role of the African diaspora uh, that mm -hmm. we often kind of, mm -hmm. um, you know, I myself being in the diaspora and, and sort of sometimes feeling very lost about how you contribute, maybe overwhelmed, I think, first, uh, because mm -hmm. you're not expected to be a center of knowledge, right? Um, you're expected to be, you're not really expected to be a generator of knowledge as well uh, on either side. So, you know, playing, being in, in this very fragile position, but also quite a very rich resource, I have to say, for either side of the table. And either side of the table here, I'm talking about the commissioners of evaluation. So we know that governments, um, like you have eloquently explained it, have sort of moved from this mode of operation, operationalizing the MDGs, SDGs, for us to, for, for, for governments sort of almost being 
moved to a point of you need to evaluate for you to justify more assistance. So how do we go back to something that is much more indigenous than that? Why did we actually do programs? Why did we bring in development from our own indigenous spaces? And I absolutely love these 10 questions. And my question is more how, and really very practically, um, you know, when we are talking about an evaluation piece that is being commissioned, whether by government or donors, how do we allow that space for those 10 questions in that OECD methodology in that EU methodology, or sometimes in a very thematic methodology that has already been prescribed from a place that has also been globally accepted. So how do you sort of see this movement beyond really the VOPA so that we're really moving that hand? Because at the end of the day, it remains like I think I was trying to say sort of this open secret, uh, or we reach out to communities like uh, Eval Indigenous, which is how I ended up finding myself in a space like this as, a, as, a, as an evaluator that felt a bit that, you know, where do you make the impact? So it's like being like-minded people. So how do we move from preaching to sort of those who are converted to those who actually need to listen into what methodologies need to be influenced by? Thank you. Yes, this can be quite, quite challenging. Um, you are not accepted in your own home country and where you are, you are not accepted. Uh, I think even for some of us who have been in the field for a long time and may have ideas, uh, we don't get even accepted by our own people in the ministries. Yeah, uh, We can be called uh, outside and uh, some of us turn out to be poster elders because uh, we have that, and we have that, and our color. So we look nice on posters. That we 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 were some of the people who, who did this and that, and uh, it's becoming challenging. The reason is that we we've given away our space, and maybe it's for monetary terms. Um, I see professors here. Yeah, who get aboard the team and we will be given what is likely to be stopped or the amount that can be given to an intern and they will accept it. So we don't value ourselves. We don't value our knowledge. So it has been happening here. Um, I get colleagues who call me and say, I'm, I'm coming, I'm flying in. Uh, I'm coming as part of the team to do this and that. I like the color in the team. And what is happening is now there is a gender part of it. If you all go around Lusaka, most of the NGOs that you may go in, you find that the head is a woman. Go to a bank, it's a multinational bank, the head is a woman because it's become fashionable to do that. So how do we get you people outside uh, to help us? It may be on a personal level. It may need you walking over to a Canadian office and talking it over. Uh, 2019, I'm calling on ideas. Ideas is supposed to spearhead most of these, um, these developments. And we've got people of color as president and vice president, but it's not happening. So we need to ask ourselves, I also see we've had uh, people of color in there. We have uh, the UN, we have USAID, that has a Zambian woman in charge. So why is it's not happening? Because of the systems, it's not easy to break what has been there for a long time. One individual can't do it. So uh, when we have like a vow indigenous, please come aboard. Yeah. You, you are near there, you let us know what's happening and may be able to voice out uh, the challenges that we are talking about. So that's one way uh, you can get your voice heard. And by, on an individual level, you can get things done which I might not be able to do. Sometimes I get attention 
because somebody somewhere in New York or London, I said there is John Njovu there in Lusaka. Why are you approaching us? So it happens. I went to UK at one time because I was um, invited by the foreign office. And when I came back, I went to a friend of mine who was in the government. I said, okay, this is what we were discussing. Can we do the same here in Zambia? And he looked at me, um, I'll get back to you. And he never got back to me. Why? I didn't have the money. So we have climate change and everybody, the NGOs now, uh, so many. Hmm? like the days of HIV and dead because it has become fashionable and that's where the money is. But like I said, we are looking at the new generations and seven generations from now. So you may be comfortable uh, with your job and your position, but we are seeing a change. I'm seeing young people coming in into Zambia and saying, could we do this? Okay, I'm going back, but I feel that as Zambians, we should do this and that. So we are getting voices from young people, not the older people. Um, they will say, oh, what is the need for me? So we need to change that. Why are we failing on a government's governance level? We have all these guys with degrees, professors, doctors, and all that, but we're still not going ahead because it has to come from inside your heart. Your link to the land should be important. And that's what we should sing about. Uh, at one time when um, the new settlers came in here, the white ones, they delinked us from our land. So you, we don't feel that need to protect our land. But you've been abroad and uh, you've, seen more and maybe you can bring change here. I thank you. <laughs> thank you, John. There are still uh, some uh, interesting questions and comments in the chat. I'm just like aware that the time is limited. Uh, so perhaps I'll hand over to uh, Daniel who may have other questions or pick or can pick on some of the questions from the chat uh, also, Daniel. Okay, thank you. Can, you. can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah. Quickly, I, I was I, I saw the ten questions and I thought they were great as well. And I was kind of thinking to myself, how would you use them when and, and who? Yes, communities use them, so they should. But as many have said, it's too late. By the time you get the, by the time you get to the community and you ask those questions, John, you could be basically very embarrassed. Um, so I, I would say that the commissioners of evaluations or even the people who design the intervention or the project should use these questions actually and, and, and make sure that they, they, they adequately kind of participate with communities in designing, not just the evaluation, but, but the whole thing actually. And, and I think now there's a good time. People are beginning to realize that the more complex world we live in, and, and the more that reveals itself, Stephen Hawking said, you know, this is the century of complexity, is, is, is around how we should lighten up on the appraisal and design. Don't make it so heavy. We seem to equate complexity with sophistication. I mean that in a technocratic sense, um, and therefore disparagingly. <laughs> um, but I, I, and to answer your question on the UK Evaluation Society, uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm not really into evaluation, I do it occasionally, but I would have thought that if you look at the UK Evaluation Society, John, look at their council of 12 members, it'd be interesting to have a look at it now, since it started in 94, to actually kind of how many people of colour are on that council, how many presentations have been made by Indigenous people, I don't mean people like me, but kind of ethnic minorities, people of color in the UK. I still take offense at being called a Caucasian, by the way, because I'm not from the Caucasus Mountains in Russia, so I don't understand why people call me that. But I, I, do, I do think seriously that, that that would be quite interesting. And I don't, it's not rhetorical, I don't know. What I want to wrap up with is um, 
the issue of resources and the for for your group, John, in terms of eval indigenous and and what to do. And I know we've been talking about the consequence of this revenue, this webinar. Obviously, we're not going to meet any objective today beyond obviously some some really important learnings and exchanges. Um, but I, I wanted to conclude with things that were implicit behind many of your messages, which comes from a Malian philosopher, and it's important for everyone to recognize this, Amadu Hampati Ba, who said that the hand that gives is always above the hand that receives. So I think it's really important where we go for resources, where you go for resources and support to that, uh, and, and to make sure, because I think that's one of the issues that has stymied the African Evaluation Association. You, you, it's like, I live in the UK, and, and if you go to the African Evaluation Group, if you go to the American, if you go to the European, you kind of get the same people turning up. You know, not saying the same thing. It, it's like English Premier League football managers. You know, one month they're managing this club and then they're, yeah, exactly. So we're kind of getting the same messages. And I think indigenous evaluation needs to get a presence in those societies, including the UK. My cricket example was the culture came to me in the UK, the West Indian culture came to me in the UK. Why can't, why can't indigenous evaluators go to the UK evaluation society and, and have a pitch as, as opposed to being a kind of an interesting kind of quaint kind of sideshow kind of thing as you were talking to me about. So front and center. So there's lots of ideas on, on how to do it. It requires resources, but resources not from the usual suspects, um, but, but from, from, we talked about it, African philanthropists. Um, look, at, look at the Alliance for the Green Revolution in Africa. Who do you think funds that? Not an African penny. Its credentials are fantastic, the peacocks. All, all people from in the staff, and there's some excellent people as well. But but it's telling, it's telling. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited and to support you in any way um, on this. So um, I I kind of finished what I had to say, wanted to say, and um, over to you, Renata. And thank you very much for everyone for participating, John. It was such an honour to have you front and centre. Mm -hmm. And Thank yeah, you. Good, good morning, good afternoon, good night, but not quite yet. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, thanks to both and thanks to all the audience. I'm sorry we could not address all the questions and the points, but there were some really interesting comments in the chat. So we will think about how we can continue this discussion because, as Daniel said, eh, not we wanted to bring forward the messages that John has uh, given us and that we all also believe in. Uh, so I'd say I'll just conclude with thanking you and with uh, saying that we will follow up and to keep in touch uh, if you have uh, proposals for next webinars and ideas for bringing uh, uh, this uh, topic forward with donors where questions about donors mm -hmm. and about how do you reverse these uh, yes, uh, systems. So we don't have an answer at least, <laughs> for sure I don't. <laughs> so uh, so keep in touch. Uh, I think everyone has the, the contact of Eval Forward and I'll just write in the uh, chat my uh, the email. And uh, yes, I think we can finish for now. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Mm-hmm.